My name is Waldo, and this is my cheap auction Range Rover. I ended part three of this video series considering whether or not to do a full engine rebuild, and I've decided that if I need to remove the cylinder heads, then I'm gonna go ahead and do the rebuild. I have the engine partially disassembled to fix the timing, which I discovered was badly in need of repair. The reason why I might need to pull the heads is because I suspect a head gasket leak due to some stop leak in the coolant, water vapor coming out of the exhaust, and half-empty coolant bottles in the boot. In order to determine if I have a head gasket issue, I'm going to perform a leak down test on all eight of the cylinders. I really should have done this before I started disassembling the engine, but it's better late than never. So this is a cylinder that had the worst compression. Now I'm going to turn up the regulator here and you see the pressure going in on this side and the pressure over here is the pressure in the cylinder itself. Turn up to about 80 PSI. The gauges show a leakage of about 4 PSI which is only 5%. This is great news since anything under 10% leakage is considered good. As for pinpointing the leak, I can hear all of the air escaping from the crankcase which means that the rings are where the air is passing. So I did a leak down test on all eight cylinders and they all had a leakage of 5% or less, which is excellent news. If there was any leaking coming from the head gasket itself, I would expect that to manifest itself as air leaking from the cooling system, which I should be able to hear and I didn't detect any of that. Sorry if the news disappoints you because I know there was a lot of support for a rebuild in the comments. However, this is also some good news because I'll be able to get this thing back together more quickly and hopefully I will have time to bring this on a cross-country road trip that I have coming up. It's probably going to be around 6,000 miles. And some of you may say that bringing this thing on a road trip when it's relatively untested is an absolutely crazy thing to do. And you might be right about that, but I was planning on bringing you guys along with me and vlogging the trip so that we all get to see if I succeed in my 6,000 mile journey or if I end up broken down on the side of the road. If you remember from part three, I had some broken off bolts in the block. Now's the time to extract them. First, a center punch will help me drill a hole in the center of the bolt. Next, a left hand drill bit will make a hole for the extractor. With a left hand bit, there's always the chance that you'll get lucky and if the drill bit catches, it can extract the bolt on its own. Because I didn't get lucky, I'll use a spiral extractor to remove the bolt. Oh yeah, take a look at that, extracted expertly. That is fantastic. I'll put a link to this extractor set down in the description because this thing is invaluable when you have broken bolts to extract. All right, so I have the camshafts locked in place with these little tools back here. And I also have the crankshaft locked in place as well. I'll start by installing the timing chain guides. I'm installing some blue thread locker on these bolts. My theory is that maybe these bolts were over torqued and that's why they broke. And so the torque spec is only 12 Newton meters, which is not very much. So if I install some blue thread locker on here, I'll feel a lot more confident that they're not gonna come undone. Yeah, so there are three timing marks you have to look for. There's one right there, another one right there on the other sprocket, and then the last is on the tensioner there. Note that I've installed the tensioner with the pin still in place. We'll remove that next. It says to apply steady tension to the guide and then we can pull the pin. That's nice and tight. 
Before I can tighten these bolts, I need to use this special tool here to tension the uh, VVT sprockets. I need to hold 35 newton meters of torque on this and tighten the exhaust sprocket bolts first. I'll set this to 32 newton meters so I can torque these bolts. Well, I got all the timing drive components in, and I think at this point it's just assembly is the reverse of removal. Cue the music and let's go. So this is my first time installing one of these stretch fit belts. The benefit here is that it's simpler because it doesn't have a tensioner and therefore reduces cost and theoretically improves reliability because there's no tensioner to go bad. Man, this is really tight. That is ridiculously tight. You guys can probably tell from the sound of my voice, but I am on day six of being sick now, and I just developed a mild fever, and unfortunately I just don't have the time to take a sick day before my trip, so I'm gonna plow through it, although not pushing myself too hard, so let's get back to work. I did lose some oil during the procedure, so I'm just gonna top it off. I'm just adding some random stuff that I had lying around. While the engine was open, there is crap that got in there, of course, so I'm gonna do an oil change before too long. So it doesn't really matter what I add here. And I'm also gonna add half a can of sea foam just to help clean up any sludge that might be stuck in any of the passageways that this engine has, because it has lots of oil passages. Oh, there we go. Oil level's good. I'm nervous but excited to start this thing up for the first time, but before I can do that, I have to fill and bleed the cooling system. Now I basically need to fill this thing up until coolant starts coming out of the bleed screws. Good. Well, I think I'm about ready to start this thing up for the first time, and not gonna lie, I'm pretty nervous. It's a pretty complex repair, and there's a lot of things that could go wrong with potentially catastrophic consequences. On the other hand, I'm also excited because I certainly hope and expect that the engine will run really well. I mean, it sounds like a normal engine to me. I think this is successful. I gotta fill this cool enough, though. It's been several days now, and I found a really big surprise with this thing. So I went ahead and got it registered and insured. I brought it for about a 10 or so mile test drive around town and I have to say it ran really well. The driving experience was great. I mean the brakes were good. The steering, the suspension were nice and tight. It accelerates well. It feels really light and nimble unlike the big heavy vehicle that it is. So I'm very very happy with that. After my little test drive, I thought it was time to do that oil change that I talked about, and so let's go into the shop and take a look. 
So here I am in the shop and you might notice that there is a different Land Rover behind me, but I'll get to that later. For now, let's take a look at this oil that came out of the Range Rover. It's a little tricky to see on camera, but it looks like a pearl metallic paint, perhaps a shade of mocha. The metal flakes seem to be non-magnetic, so I assume they're bits of aluminum. The oil filter element, which was originally white in color, is also incredibly dirty for such a short drain interval. So obviously having all of that junk in the oil is not a good thing, but I figure there are probably two possible scenarios. And number one, which would be preferable, is if all of that stuff was already in there at the bottom of the oil pan built up over time and adding the sea foam allowed it to thin the oil and stir all of that stuff up. Uh, if that's the case, then when I do my next oil change, the oil should be clean and maybe the filter will be a little bit dirty from whatever was left over, but basically it would be an issue that goes away. Scenario number two is that there's something seriously wrong with the engine that is currently um, generating or wearing all of that aluminum. If that's the case, then, well, it's going to keep happening until I fix whatever's wrong. I put another 10 or 20 miles on this thing, so a quick look at the oil filter and... Yeah, that's really, really dirty. It's full of aluminum again. So there's obviously something wearing inside this engine that's causing all of that aluminum in the oil. And it's kind of funny that it runs so well because I'm pretty sure that if I keep driving it like this, it won't run very well for much longer. I do of course have to wonder what is it that's wearing inside the engine. So one of the things that I did off camera is I removed the camshafts in order to retime the engine and I followed the book on how to put them back in. I made sure they were clean. I made sure they were lubricated. I used the right torque specs. I torqued them progressively and in the right order. It's, it's kind of a complex operation, but I'm pretty sure I did it right. One of the things that I noted when I had them out is that there aren't actually any bearings for the camshafts. The camshafts themselves just rub up against the cylinder head and the upper bearing cap. If there's anywhere that's going to be wearing aluminum, that comes to mind as a possibility. I guess it's also a possibility that maybe just some junk or something got inside the engine and that could be causing the wear. Either way, I think it's very likely that I need a new engine. I certainly could take it apart and try to see what the problem is and repair it, but at least at this point, I am really done with this thing. I guess we'll see how I feel when I come back from my trip. Speaking of my trip, my plan B is now to take this, my 2005 Land Rover Discovery 3. I purchased this at an auction even cheaper than this at only $1,700, and it has been nothing but unreliable. Taking a 17-year-old unreliable Land Rover on a 6,000-mile cross-country road trip, what could possibly go wrong? At this point, some of you may be expecting me to hop in my new excavator here and crush this thing with the enormous bucket. However, if I did that, what would I do in part five of this series? In all seriousness, do let me know down in the comments, what do you think I should do with this at this point? I know a lot of you guys have been recommending doing an LS swap, and that's definitely something that I would consider. One of the biggest difficulties with that is the computer integration. Everything is computerized in this vehicle, and messages from the engine get sent to the transmission and the instrument cluster and all of that over the CAN bus. And the message format that it uses is proprietary, and it would need to be reverse engineered. It's the same thing with a donor engine that would go in it, whether it's an LS or heck, maybe like a 5.7 liter V8 from a Toyota. Wouldn't that be the most reliable Range Rover ever if I put one of those in? I would need to do the same thing and reverse engineer how everything works on the CAN bus from the donor vehicle as well, so that I can build a translation layer in between the engine and the rest of the vehicle. But maybe you can help me. If you work for Jaguar Land Rover and you have access to that proprietary CAN CAN bus message data format and sent it to me, that would make my life so much easier and I assure your confidentiality. If I don't do some sort of a custom engine swap on this, then I think what is pretty likely is that I'll just buy another Range Rover that was totaled with a working engine and just do an engine swap that way. That's probably the cheapest way for me to get this thing going. In any case, I think the lesson from this video series is don't buy a cheap Range Rover unless you have plenty of time and money to throw at it. I want to thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in part five of the video series for that thing, where I trek across the country and hopefully I don't break down too many times.
We're going out west. Yeehaw. Oh my god, my fly is undone. Woo.